Good evening, good evening, and welcome to all of you. I'm so glad that we have such a turnout, wonderful sense of motivation, and of course, the interest in our very distinguished uh, speaker for this evening. I know it's a weekend, and it's a weekend after a public holiday, so the fact that you've packed up this room is really very impressive, and, uh, and I find it particularly gratifying. I also find it very gratifying indeed that Professor Scheid has kindly agreed to join us and to offer a lecture um, for, the, for the Center for Religious uh, Studies. Um, I don't think he, the, our speaker needs very, very much um, introduction. He is, as you know, a professor of Roman religion at the Collège de Rome, uh, and had that position for quite a long time. Um, of course, being at the Collège de France is the, the crowning achievement of many a life, and there we are here, incorporated in the person of our speaker. Now, of his uh, interests, his interests, are, of course, are in Roman religion. Um, I find particularly suggestive his uh, introduction to Roman religions, which was translated um, about 10 years ago by Edinburgh University Press, um, uh, which um, in, a, in, a, in a move of conceptual robustness actually starts with questions of method and concept, moves on to cultic structures and rituals, and only finally does it go to actors, exegesis, and speculations, which, uh, for those of you um, who have heard me speak or who know me, uh, find it extremely congenial, as far as I'm concerned, putting um, practice first and speculation on practice and the study of practice uh, later, and trying to derive divinity from rituals of divinity uh, rather, than the, rather than the other way around. Uh, with, uh, with Jesper Svendro, who is a member of the Swedish Academy, uh, they wrote, he wrote a book on the myths and metaphors of weaving in Rome and in Asia. They found that the title of the craft of Zeus, myths of weaving and uh, fabric. Um, of matters of conceptual moment, I particularly find engaging an article he wrote together again with Jesper Svendro on Hermann Usener and the Götterland of Hermann Usener, which they call a great theogony. Hermann Usener's attempt to periodize a kind of natural history of the evolution of the idea of divinity, which is published over a hundred years ago, but it still bears a lot of relevance, and it is a credit to the authors of that particular article that they have seen the crucial importance of some of the conceptions to our studies of religion today. Finally, I'd like to mention the interest to us, or to many of us here, a book that he edited with uh, Muhammad Ali and Amir Moizzi, Loyon, on the floor, and Michel Loyot, which contains such a number very good number of themes of interest from Oriental cults of Rome to Guillaume Postel to the to the interests of Gustave Flaubert to Homer and to that extraordinary chronicle of the kings of France and of Ottoman sultans by Joseph Hakohen, which was published in 1554. The theme today, which is on, of course, water, bathing, and the gods. Um, is, I'm told, inspired by the reputation of Budapest as the city of baths, um, and hence particularly apt for something to play on the city. But from what I could see from the short abstract, it uh, promises to bring out quite a number of interesting um, considerations regarding the way in which religions are seen or not seen. Um, it's quite often that people assume that a structure, because it is a little bit strange or a little bit exotic, must, by the, by the nature of things, have a religious function. Uh, this is uh, no less the case in, uh, in, with certain baths of Rome, uh, which will be mentioned by our 
guest speaker, as incidentally by ancient petroglyphs on Arabian rocks of women with flowing hair, again assumed to be, in fact, goddesses, rather than what they, in fact, were, namely, dancers. And with that, I give the word to our Thank you very much. Uh, you have taken one of my papers, I think. No, it's okay, it's okay. Thank you. I'm very pleased to speak in this university and uh, today in Budapest about this theme. And actually, as you hear it, um, I think in Budapest people know what bathing is and what a, a thermal building is. In France, they no longer, or in England, know what it is. So they come up with very strange ideas about all that. In Roman history, the existence of temples associated with thermae, baths, on the rural territory of the cities is often considered as a proof for the existence of so-called spring cults. Thus, a rural sanctuary is supposedly invariably related to a spring or a pit, even when there is no such thing around. I give you one example. Uh, in this book, uh, it's about a temple located in the Halat forest near saint lys 30 kilometers from Paris, east of Paris in France. And it's a good example for this desperate quest for water because there is no spring, there is no pit, there is nothing. But despite that, the archaeologists go on looking for it and explain the cult, the ex votos, by a spring cult. That's the most absurd thing I have ever seen. I told it to them, I prefaced their book, which is very fine from an archaeological standpoint, but I said, why don't you cut that? I know, there must be a spring. Okay. Um, this theory is due to the influence of the natural cults invented during the Romantic period, when the Germans or the Celts were supposed to have venerated previously um, natural elements, such as the sun, the fire, the air, or the water. These ideas are still current today for two ma uh, main reasons. The first one is that during the 19th century, thermalism was a very powerful trend, at least in Western Europe, during um, this time whereby water was uh, thought to have healing powers, which is all but proven. During the 1960s, Eliadian phenomenology, which also celebrated the healing power of the water, gave a renewed importance to these venerable ideas. But these theories are far from convincing. Nothing proves actually the existence of natural cults such as the Romantic imagined them. Archaeological evidence suggests that the veneration of water, or of the nature as such, was never part of cult practices. Nature wasn't divinized in Rome or in Greece. Ancient philosophers could reduce all gods or goddesses to the four elements, or to one of them. But it was speculation, not religion. In the Roman world, religion was a set of private or public rituals addressed to precise divine persons in a sanctuary on a very given day. Admittedly, there were cult of springs, lakes or rivers, but these cults were not addressed to the springs, lakes or rivers themselves, but rather to the owners of these phenomena who eventually used them as a residence. The nymphs were ephemeral goddesses related to the purity, the babbling and the freshness of the springs, for example. But they weren't the spring. Apollo or Hercules could discover, there are some stories of this kind, and own springs. Neptunus administered the power that resided in water and so on. And when the Roman said that the water was sacred, sake, the word sacred didn't mean the same thing as today. Similarly, when the commentator of Virgil, Servius, wrote uh, at the beginning of the 5th century uh, CE that nullus fons non sake est, there is no spring that isn't sa uh, uh, sacred, it does not mean that the water was sacred, that the spring was sacred. In the, sense, in the sense which we give to this concept today, but very simply that every spring belonged to a deity. 
be it a nymph or another god or goddess. Sake was applied to things or beings which were given to a god or goddess according to the ancestral rules, which means through an official act performed by a magistrate with a commanding power, or in the family uh, milieu by the, the, the head of the family in virtue of his power as pater familias. That which did not belong to the gods was, was declared profanum in Roman sacred law, a substantial distinction between its um, legal property of the gods, not property of the gods. Now, what were the properties of water in a spring sanctuary? Why would one bath in this kind of water? Why did the Romans join Thermae to temples? These are the points I would like to analyze shortly, using mainly archaeological evidence, but also some inscription and text. First, I would like to stress that water was primar primarily used to purify. If you visit the Apollo temple in Pompeii, for example, um, you discover in the southeast angle of the courtyard of the sanctuary a water basin, a labrum, as the Romans said, which was obviously used to wash hands, maybe feet, before entering the cultic area. You see here the portico and this modern rope, which is uh, thought to uh, repress mass tourism, is a good uh, indication of a um, uh, legal limit who is in front of the altar of the temple and the temple itself is the distinction between sacred and profanum. And when you leave the, the sector of profanum, you wash your hands. And often before starting a ritual action in a complex ritual, you return there and you start again washing and then you go on. So it's really an a tool of ritual action. It's not something for healing, obviously. Water is similarly present in Ostia, for example, in a city. Here you see this uh, public uh, fountain in front of the temple of the Bonadea. And uh, close to that you have also the four Republican Tempietti and other temples, and in front of it a fountain, an infeum. That's very current. And as well, we found that as well in the city as outside the urban, uh, urban context. As for example, in, um, in the Abruzzi, in uh, Sulmona, in the Hercules temple, which is here, that's the area, and you go to this point using um, steps, and at the highest point of these steps, you have the facility to, to, to wash before entering an area which is, let's say, sacred. Everyone understands this. It's very clear. There are hundreds of other examples. None of the gods I have mentioned is a spring god, and obviously we are not dealing with healing cults here. They are all civic gods. Uh, and, and cults, uh, public uh, cults of the cities where these people were living in. We encounter the same situation here as in the Aulularia of Plotus. So it's a very old thing, this ritual uh, necessity, where two people go and wash before celebrating sacrifice. Huh? As for me, if you no longer meet me, I'm going to wash myself in order to sacrifice and it turns all the time uh, in literature of this kind. So that's not a surprise, but just to remember you that water is mainly uh, used in the sanctuary to wash and to purify yourself before acting. The same connection exists for termi. You say, okay, a basin, you, I understand, but why a bath? In Rome itself, there were so many bath buildings that every temple was close to such a facility not to speak of fountains. So I provide some examples taken in smaller towns where things are more simple and where you see anything. In Rome, often you are in, 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 in very difficult, uh, archaeological difficult situations that you cannot do a clear reasoning. In Ostia, the situation, for example, is uh, a lot more visible than and easy in Rome. I have here given 
uh, some examples here um, with a certain number of red dots who are temples, private or public, and then in blue you have the, um, that's also a temple, you have the termi you are, which are close to, 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 to temples. You see everywhere, even Piazzale delle Corporazioni, the big temple, which was one of the main temples, had the Terme di Nettuno close to it, and so on. Everywhere you have this association. And also in Rome, I must say, there are examples where it's very clear. For example, on, on the, the Palatine, in front of the temple of uh, Magna Mater, Saibili, the other side of the, the, the small uh, road or street which is uh, passing before, you have termai. So uh, if you went to the temple, I think you went to the termai. Um, the major cult places located on the agar, on the territory of the cities, are generally also provided with termai and even often with a theater or a circus. I'll take two examples, but because here you have a temple isolated in the countryside, why, ter why termai? First example, it's the famous spring uh, san sanctuary of the Clitumnus, an affluent of the Tiber, situated between Spoleto and Spello today, which un unfortunately has never been discovered, so I cannot show you an image. It is this uh, famous spring sanctuary is celebrated in Roman poetry and in a famous description of Pliny the Younger. I'll turn uh, to this text later uh, on. For the moment, you can see only at the end that um, Pliny clearly separates the description of the sanctuary, is the whole thing uh, of the text which is not underlined, and the termai of the balineum, as he said, of the, the site. Uh, the Clitumnus sanctuary was uh, situated on the limits of the territory of Spoleto. And under Augustus, it was given to the colonia, the new colonia of Spello, his Spellum, by Augustus, as a sort of um, gift, wife, maybe for political reasons, due to the civil war of uh, 40, uh, 43, uh, uh, 42, and uh, we don't know why. Anyway, he took this sanctuary, isolated it, and gave it to a, a close-by city. And it was not even on the territory of that city, but it was um, on the territory borders of Spoleto, and between Spello and his sanctuary, there was even another city territory of Fulginium. Uh, Fulginium. It's, um, no, I, the, the, I don't remember the Italian name. So that's very common that the territory of a city has parts, bits uh, everywhere. Hmm? Uh, Naples had even parts of its territory on Creta. Uh, it's a very tricky thing, the territory. So that's a, I, I say it, I make a parenthesis, because it's a good example of what the territory of a city is. Anyway, so he, he gave that to the Hispelatus, to the colony of Hispelum, and uh, asked them to give Hospitium a possibility to stay there when people came, and uh, also to offer him, them the Balinium, the right and the facilities to have a bath. You must see, know that this uh, sanctuary is also situated on the limit between Etruria and uh, Sabine. So um, uh, there were every year big celebrations there and people from Etruria came and so for one day and they walked and, and rode and so came, were, were dirty when they came on and so they had to ride to sleep and to eat and also to bath. That's one of the examples. Uh, I can give another example very far from there. It's on the territory of the Treviri in Gallia, Trier. And you have close to the border a city, a vicus, called Belginum. And there they had uh, responsibility of a, a temple of Apollo um, with a, a spring building, the temple, and then a balneum and also something that resembles uh, a house, 
and is the Hospitalia. And here it was mainly an administrative building of the people running this sanctuary and this place, they had their archives there or whatever. So you see the same uh, thing as Pliny says, uh, at nearly the same time, uh, 1400 kilometers uh, towards the north in, in Trier, in Hochscheid. And during the Empire, Hospitalia and Balnea were uh, standard equipments of sanctuaries located in the countryside. Sometimes, as in Silmona, it wasn't so far away, a simple basis, basin would suffice, it's, it's, it's enough. But often you have Balnea, because in this time people had money. Let's take another example where the evidence is complete, so to speak. We are six miles west from Rome. Uh, that's the reconstruction of the buildings, I think. Uh, it's nice, but uh, we are so six, five, six miles from Rome, the border of the Tiber, in a place called La Mariana in the grove of Dea Dia. Um, it's a sanctuary which has lived from Augustus to the middle of the third century AD. Uh, and it is very famous because it has given a lot of inscriptions describing the cult in this place for three centuries. And we have also the buildings. We have done excavations and now we have a, a plan of the, the place. The complex of the goddess Dea Dia is dominated, uh, it's an urban excavation, it's very difficult, so uh, don't be surprised. Um, is dominated by um, the rotunda, something like the Pantheon, we just made a rotunda, uh, of the goddess, probably sur surrounded by the grove itself and connected to a second space, oriented on it, uh, which are at the foot of the hill, uh, and which is um, a, a balneum. This central space here is filled with another space which is a little bit uh, older. These two buildings are contemporaneous. Bath and Portico are of the Severan times, Alexander Severus, 225, uh, it seems. And here in the middle you still have a park also which is of Flavian times maybe with the temple of the divinized emperors, uh, which was uh, founded at this time in this place. Now, let's come back to uh, our question. Um, so the, there you have the things. Um, maybe there's even something else. Yeah, that's the reconstruction of uh, the three spaces hi hierarchized uh, on the spot. Now, why was there a balneum at this place? What is, was it a healing cult, a healing bath, or what? There is no reason to suppose that it was. There was a spring here, still today, a very powerful spring, um, west of the complex, which presumably, uh, presumably was used for the termi. We didn't find the aqueduct, but it must be buried under the modern street and the houses, so we couldn't find it. If you, ha you have uh, some doubt, just read yet now the, the minutes of the priests who celebrated the cult, the cult at Deam Diam every year. This document of 218 um, describes the first day of the sacrifice offered to Dea Dia. The first day is celebrated in Rome during a formal lunch arranged in the house of the annual master of the Collegium here it was in 218, the emperor, so the meeting took place in, a, in his house on the Palatine, in the temple of the Divi, which, which served as a sort of domestic chapel for the palace. And you can read anyway that the arvels arrive, perform set, some rituals, go to the bath, gather again, and then celebrate the formal banquet. Item post meridiem, afternoon, a balneo, turning from the bath, they sit down on chairs, and then they uh, ate the banquet. The verbal, the second day, as on this uh, copy of 240, 40, um, they do the same thing again, in the grove this time. 
The verbal describes the, the master's activities. It starts by that during the morning, after having, having finished preliminary rituals and sacrifices, he uh, writes in the verbal, the codex, that he has been present and has celebrated the ritual. Then he goes to the bath in Balneo Ibit. Uh, he he uh, unvests, he puts down the toga praetexta with the very solemn and decorated um, toga wa worn by magistrate and pre official priest in official action. So he undresses and in Balneo Ibit, the Latin Ibit is not the best, but we are in the third century, Romanic language is developing. Uh, and then the other priests arrive, and uh, even if the uh, verbal doesn't say it, we can presume that they too went first to the bath before eating a first sacrificial meal. So there you have the total description of it. So we can consider without any doubt that this bath served for the cleansing of the celebrants and not for other purposes. The only uh, strange fact is why a big building there uh, for, for this, uh, you can see there were, um, I don't know, you, had not, you don't have the list of the people present. The Arvals were 12 and usually there were from four to six per, uh, people present. The attendants of the Roman citizens, there were a lot of people because after the sacrifice there were horses races, so the people, horse races, so the people came. It was a very popular pay, place, but this wasn't for the normal citizens, it was only for the priests. So they built this uh, bath building you have seen, uh, which is a rather big building, um, but it's only um, made for these uh, 12 guys at the most. But they are senator of the highest level, the emperor being regularly among them. So they need a real huge bathing uh, facility. That's the only thing which is a bit surprising, but in Rome for senators it isn't surprising at all. But in all these cases no particular kind of water is uh, specified. The water is only fresh and pure and it is appropriated for the cleansing. The Romans say us that the best is to have natural water and not uh, water of a cistern or so. What, what about the case now when water undoubtedly comes from a thermal sp uh, spring? where the divine owner of the spring is also, maybe, a healing god. I would start with an example from Tunisia. Uh, in Jbelust, 32 kilometers southwest of Tunis. The anonymous site, we don't know the name, the antique name, of Jbelust is flanked by a, a set of tanks which are of no interest uh, for our subject. Uh, they are they bring water, they stock water for the aqueduct Zaguan Cartago, who was built uh, at, in the middle of the second century uh, CE. And uh, every uh, 10 kilometers or so, they had sort of reserve some days of, of water for the aqueduct if they had to repair uh, uh, the, um, the, 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 the construction. But it's a spot where there are, even today, there are a lot of, uh, of springs, so um, they knew it and they used it. Our spring is here, it's the red dot, in the middle of a temple, which is located under the temple, and the, the hot water from there is brought to the bath. Two phases of the temple are apparent in this site. The first one is a, sim a simple building, uh, there's a, a general map of the, the, the part of the, the site in the highest part of the sanctuary. You have the temple and porticus, you have the aqueduct, you see it, and then other buildings. Later on, uh, it was Christianized and the church was built, um, an entrance here, um, an atrium, uh, that's not our problem. And uh, the first building we have, uh, the spring was um, uh, covered by a, a small square building you have there. We call it temple. It's very badly preserved. And the spring was behind it, but, but under the ground. 
part of it was under the ground, maybe with a, a vault um, protecting it. And uh, from there, that was the, uh, the site of the, you see, the, um, the spring, the hot spring, and the um, canalization who brings it uh, towards the aqueduct. Here there is a big hole, you, you understand why, and uh, everything which was in the middle has disappeared. And there you see the, um, the aqueduct and uh, the canalization, how it uh, starts running down the hill. Um, the second, um, um, the thermal water here was two meters under the surface, uh, but it was already uh, in an aqueduct. You couldn't see the water, nor in the temple, nor in, uh, outside the temple until it came down the, um, the hill. This conduct has been destroyed by the modifications of the second phase of the site, um, which is in, was due to the construction, I think, of the, this big aqueduct and in money they, they became at this time. And a new temple was built. Here you can see the remains of the walls of the uh, first, um, the first um, temple, so to say, here. Uh, here it is. It's uh, not very well uh, preserved, but uh, you can see it. And obviously, I cannot show hundreds of images, but uh, you just trust me. And here you see the, the, first, uh, the first spring. Then they built on it a huge temple uh, with a podium, a real temple, would we say, with a colonnade in front and a big stair and a portico. And it has this, uh, yeah, and there was a problem with the spring. They had to look for more water, or for water, hot water underground, and they dig a big hole of seven meters deep and found a grotto, a natural grotto with, um, with water, um, hot water. And there you see the, the excavation and even remains of the vault, which afterwards covered uh, the two parts of, uh, from the two parts of the temple, this um, excavation. And in the underground, you have the ways they collected the hot water and brought it to the aqueduct, six, seven meters down. And uh, the map uh, of this new temple is this way. You see a portico, uh, the huge temple, uh, which has replaced the small first temple, the walls covered the hole and was under the colonnade and the stairs who brought, uh, conducted to the, the courtyard of the temple. These two uh, phases of the temple were um, linked to two um, phases also of a bath. The first one was here in the middle of this uh, sort of clevus. The second one uh, conducted to a, a, a very big thermal building which was in the 5th, 6th century uh, surrounded by a villa when the site was abandoned by the pagans, let's say, and was bought by someone or someone uh, received it from uh, the city who, who owned this temple, Utina, maybe. Two, the two phases of the temple are associated with two sets of balnea. The first one I have shown where it is, was built in the middle part of the, the, the way conducting to the foot of the hill uh, at a short distance in front of the temple court. Its entrance was um, uh, made by a, by a rather strange building uh, which uh, with uh, very old mosaics, um, the end of the first century um, CE, which were destroyed um, later on, uh, the second century. And uh, we discovered progressively that here, this building is there. And then here we have basins um, here. Um, and uh, also there with the connections, etc., we which were bathing facilities cut in the rock. Very simple, very uh, elementary. But there were the first balnea 
of the place. We uh, unfortunately couldn't uh, excavate the whole thing. It was a huge work. Now we know what it is and someday uh, we, we maybe can excavate it. But it's clear you had here at 10, 20 meters from the temple the first bathing facility. For our purpose that's enough. Then uh, they found that this was too small. That's also why they deepened the, 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 the spring uh, capture and they built a new, uh, uh, that's the place uh, what we had, um, and they um, built this huge thing, uh, second half of the second century CE, um, and brought the, the hot water there. I don't not uh, explain a lot, it's a very huge um, bathing facility and what the interesting it started, I don't uh, tell you the whole story, but also an information. Uh, it was the first phase, we don't know it really, because it has nearly entirely disappeared in the, the refactions and the, the reparations of the building. But very quickly, in the third century, you entered there by the room uh, 17. You could undress in 24, and then you went here, and here in the middle there was a cold bath. And from there, you could go to a tepidarium under the, the sky. And uh, from the tepidarium, you could also go to a caldarium under a cupola. And that were the first uh, bathing facilities. And then it was enlarged. They added a second warm bath there. Uh, there were also uh, different uh, private bathing facilities you could rent. And what's most, and then there were changes everywhere, that's not the problem. These green fields are very interesting. They were there to cool up the water. It was at 55 degrees, it was too hot to sit in. So the problem was not to get warm water, but to have it cooled down, because you would burn yourself. I can say I, I, what, uh, the hammam still exists, the, the, the spring still exists. And even with boots, you cannot uh, stay in it for more than a minute. Uh, so that's very original as a uh, system of cooling down the, 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 the hot water. So that's the facility. I have even photographs. That's the, the uh, tepid bath and with rainwater, unfortunately. Uh, and that's the warm bath. But it's uh, now let's come back to our problem. It's undoubtedly a bath which also which was meant for healing also or bringing relief because uh, we can say it from a very warm water is good and actually if you sit down in your bathtub at home you have the same effect on your uh, muscles or in your bones if you have uh, diseases but maybe you do it alone it's not under surveillance but uh, even today the tunisian uh, social security uses for for people who have had fractures or so and but the architect can prove that it was thought to be a building for long emerg uh, emergence in the vo in the water because uh, there are too many steps everywhere there are 30 people for example without any problem and leaving space could sit in only in the tepid bath. Actually, 150 people could sit in this warm or tepid water at the time when the ther uh, thermi were at the, the longest exposition. They could play chess or I don't know what. Anyway, they could treat their, their, their bones or whatever, or skin diseases, but it's mainly for bones also. So there you have um, um, uh, the, uh, the fact that we are undoubtedly dealing with water and termi that could relieve a certain number of ailments. The owner of the spring is not known. It's a place in Tunisia without inscription, which is a sort of farce, because in Tunisia you have inscriptions everywhere, but it's like that. A small statue of Esculapius and one of Hygia have been found, but there is no indication that they belong to, a div to the divine owner of the place. They are a little bit small. Maybe uh, Esculapius and Hygia have owned a chapel somewhere on the spot, uh, as it is very us usual. So we don't know the owner of the temple, if it was Saturn or Apollo or whatever, or the nymph Aquae, maybe. Um, that's a common name in Africa. But uh, 
is like just that. What seems to be the case is that the spring water is only accessible at a certain distance from the temple. That's the important fact. If you look, you see that circa the, where I have made this line, until there you couldn't even see the water. Maybe certain days when the, 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 the channel uh, wasn't really well closed, you could see fume coming out in the morning, but that's, that's all. You couldn't touch nor see the water. And then where there is Krivus, there you have this first bath, and obviously there you could see and sit in the water, use it for whatever purpose you, you, you wanted it. Now, uh, is this fact, which is the important fact I want to speak about it, is that common in archaeology of spring sanctuaries? And here we are, doubtly is a spring sanctuary, because the spring comes out in the middle of the temple. It is the case. There are numerous examples that show the same arrangement. We could stay here until 10 o'clock tonight and I could uh, send you maps, uh, plans and, 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 and slides of cases like that. Let's take some examples. In Africa itself, 20 kilometers from um, Jebelus, there is Sahuan. And Sahuan, uh, there you have a, a very famous spring sanctuary because it's the head of the aqueduct uh, Rome, uh, uh, Rome, Sahuan, Carthago, uh, which brings water to Carthago, mainly to the terms of Antoninus, but um, it's still, we, we, we still uh, want to know why they brought this water to Carthago, because at the end it's quite strange. We don't know what they did actually with it. But anyway, there is a spring sanctuary there. It's a very famous, uh, the Mount uh, Sahuan there, 1,200 meters, and around five, 600 meters, you have this sanctuary um, where uh, you have at the end of this uh, platform, you have the temple of uh, the spring. It's also anonymous. We don't know Aquae, uh, Zikae, or something like that. And uh, if you look to the map, you can see that the water passes through, again, the, 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 the temple, uh, the archaeologists uh, made even um, a hole today. You can see the spring water flushing by, but it's six, seven meters deep, like in Jebelust. So you could never see in the Roman period the water, um, which was, there were a lot of, of fountains uh, there of emerge, uh, uh, how you see, of. Um, the water coming out of the rock, and uh, it was kept it and brought down the hill towards the aqueduct and also to a basin. So the first place where you could touch the water and use it was here. And then, uh, even in the first, there's an older uh, phase, it's the same thing. And then you could use it when it come up, but it's no longer in the temple. So in the temple itself, you couldn't see anything. It's the same thing in Numidia, in Algeria, in a, uh, a site which is very close to Jebelust. It's, it's called Aquae Flavianae, built by um, a Roman military and, at this place. And you have a square temple around the spring, but you, you, you don't go in Roman temples normally. It's not a church. And around there were inscriptions, and then you have uh, a little bit far, uh, further, you have the Balneum, which is very close to ours because uh, you had to cool down the water again uh, because uh, you, had, don't, don't, you just had to bring in a little bit of, of uh, cool, uh, uh, cool water, uh, fresh water to mi make mixtures, etc., and in order to sit down. But you so see that it's very close of our thing. And it's again the same thing. We can go to another place, for example, in the south of France, cr uh, close to Béziers, there's a bath which was famous in the 19th century, Balaruc, and there you have um, the uh, water is coming out in a cultic area of Neptunus, the god of the force in the water. There is a spring in the temple, but uh, it's just visible, but you couldn't go in it. You had to go in the portico to another place to find the bath which is here, with the same spring. Again, the same map. 
uh, that's the, the, the arrangement in the temple itself. Bath in England is also very well known. Uh, you see how they um, preserved the original hole of water uh, which was there, the reservoir of the spring. A temple was built here and uh, connected to the spring. You could walk around it and look to it. You could look to it uh, through windows, but you only could use it. Uh, that's the temple. Huh? Uh, you could uh, go in here and uh, look at it. You could look from here, but you could bath only in the bathing facility, the balneum, over this line, or at uh, when it uh, came out in the drain. There you could drink it or, or use it for whatever purpose. I have maybe another example. Let's go back to Hochscheid. You have the spring which comes out in the temple, and you see that is uh, totally separated from the balneum and the hospitalia. So if you took a bath, it was not in this facility. This water was, at this time, not usable. Uh, another example, the last, uh, Heckenmünster is again uh, close to Trier. You have uh, spring sanctuaries with uh, springs coming out in temples or here, but the bathing facility is there and there, and there, and there is also Hospitalia again, because you are on the countryside. It's always the same, the same story. That's how they imagined it. And then the last example, a famous, yeah, that's the spring sanctuary. Uh, in Alesia, the Apollo Morpurgus sanctuary, you have the temple, and then a balneum, and uh, you can see that the, uh, the spring again crosses the temple, but underneath you cannot see it, and it's only visible in a nymphaeum outside this precinct and in the balneum. So, uh, what you can see that the complex of Gebelust isn't particular. Now, what happens in the termi? Do people bath there, in these cases, which are spring sanctuaries, in sacred water? Even if we use the word sacred in its proper, that means antique meaning, this was not the case. Let's take Pliny's text again. Um, his description of the Clitumnus sanctuary is very important for our purpose. He describes how a certain number of springs gather in a great basin dominated by the Clitumnus temple. It is impossible, he says, to enter the basin. You could only navigate on it, which means, or so it seems, to go by boat to the temple, because it's a large basin, uh, where you uh, could draw sortes, divinatory uh, sticks, and consult the god about uh, what you wanted to know. A bridge separated the space, Pliny goes on, which he calls the space which is called sacrum. Um, I don't know where it is, yes. Um, all these uh, springs uh, gather to, in a basin, uh, quod ponte transmititor, over which there is a bridge. This bridge is terminus sacri profanique. This bridge is the limit between a space called sacrum and a space called Profanum. So that's the distinction I made at the beginning. One part of it is the sacrum, the other profanum. And he said uh, that in um, the previous part you could eventually, uh, maybe use a, a boat to go to the temple for ritual actions, but the other side of the bridge you even could uh, bath in it. So it was uh, another utilization. And this distinction is, is, is also explicit in another evidence, for example in the Hercules temple at Tivoli, close to Rome, where you have um, uh, an inscription um, on a stone at the border of the Hercules temple, that's the um, some literature for, for the distinction, uh, Sacrum Profanum, you have the, the, the inscription, Lapides Profanes into Sacrum. 
It was the end of the Republic. The stones are, the inscription, stones are profane. Inside, it's sacrum. So that's the way they uh, trace the limit. Huh? Where the stone is, the stone itself still is profanum. The other side, it's sacrum. And you have it around the sanctuary. So if you transfer Pliny's distinction to, to our seed, site or those of uh, um, thing of uh, Tivoli to our site in Gibelust, uh, you would get this uh, image. Um, the water is inaccessible until it is used in the basins of the Termai, of the first or the second uh, bathing facility. Um, above this line, it is inaccessible. Because when the water is sacred, one cannot have access to it and use it for human uh, purposes. This means that the water that was used for bathing was not intrinsic, intrinsically holy water, but rather a gift from the god or the goddess. It was simply water given by the divinity, in the same way that the meat which Kultores ate at the sacrificial banquet was part of a victim that the celebrants gave as a whole to the god or goddess, who symbolically, after having received her part, returned it to uh, her, his or her human partners. One precision, usually a balneum is not a place of cult. You often can read that also. But there can be, who knows, some cases where a balneum has a cult place. There can be a chapel of Fortuna, Balnearis, for example, somewhere then. The good fortune of, of bathing, because bathing, a Roman bathing facility with um, um, floors heated by, um, by furnaces was a very dangerous place because uh, it often splits and, and you fall down and were badly burned. It was a dangerous place to be, not to, to speak about uh, moral dangers you can face in the Balnea. So the fortuna is always there. And uh, that can be, but can a balneum be a cult place? One of the clear examples for a long time was in Sardinia, in Fondongianus, where in this bath uh, had been found, it appeared, uh, a certain number of dedications to the Nymphae Salutares, the um, health-bringing nymphs. And so you could say these terms are really a sanctuary a healing sanctuary or whatever of the nymphs, but uh, you must always go down to the evidence. If you look closer, the investigation shows that the dedications to our nymphs were, I have even the, the text, were actually reused at the late period and were part of the steps of the cold water, water basin. So it's a later arrangement when there were maybe already Christians, they just used the stones to get down in a basin of cold water. One can conclude that in the surroundings there was a temple or chapel of these nymphs, like in Jebelust or in all these other places, and the term I maybe belong to this nymphae, Augustae, or whatever, um, um, and that they uh, obviously brought um, health and well-being to the users, but the term I themselves were not their temple. To come back to Jebelust, we can conclude that when people used it, the water of the spring was profane in the Roman sense of the word. I wouldn't lose time in discussing the fact that in Africa people didn't know the refinements of Roman sacred law and terminology. First, because the people who built this termae in Jblust were the veterans or of two Augustan Pegi, the, the small communities after the civil war in somewhere 28 uh, BC, or the Augustan veteran colony of Utina, which is at nine kilometers. And they knew all that, obviously. Then you can see that this kind of distinction between two types of space and water, as Pliny or other written, written, written evidence describe it, is uh, attested elsewhere in the whole Roman world. It's a common feud feature in the Roman world, so let's don't la lose time with it. You have maybe noted that I used for the opening image a splendid patera found in Otanes in uh, Cantabria, in Spain. It bears the inscription Salus Umeritana, but one doesn't understand if it is the name of the spring 
or only a theme. That's the good health of this place, of, of this city. Anyway, we have the same construction of the topography of a von Sacker. You have a nymph lying in a forest somewhere in this place, and the water comes down from an urn, it's a very conventional image, and flows down the hill or something like that. And it goes to a basin. Uh, there, in this basin, there is, um, it seems, a bridge or something. And you can see that in front of this basin, um, a slave or young guy is taking water which he fills in in an amphora or container. And maybe he brings it down here to this um, car where it is uh, put in a, in a barrel and so on. It's a cult place. You have in the forest um, a peasant or something uh, uh, who is offering something to, off to the nymph of the sanctuary. And then in the urban part, I would say, of the territory, you have a, a man in toga, so a citizen or senator or whatever, who is doing a sacrifice to the same goddess, but uh, in the city. And you see also an old uh, person drinking this water. It's good and healthy water. But what's inter interesting for us is that uh, there is this separation again between one part where there is only religious action and then one part where it is used by uh, human uh, beings. They are for drinking. It's a sort, it's an aqueduct without um, a construction. It's an aqueduct with uh, barrels bringing uh, the water to the city. Um, there is another um, um, image um, which is even clearer. Uh, it comes also. It comes from England. Is the the handle of a patera, and uh, from Cathaitin in, in in Wales. You have um, Minerva. Remember that in Bath, the owner of the Bath was uh, Minerva Sulis. We have Minerva, who has the foot on um, the amphora where the water comes out and it flows down uh, the hill. There is her temple there, someone who is offering a sacrifice in front of it. And uh, then the water everywhere flows into the patera. It's a sort of joke of the artist. But you can see that, again, the water is used only from here if you put it in your patera to drink or whatever. So it's the same uh, um, image again, which turns up in, even in um, images. If we conclude by enumerating, um, I would conclude by enumerating the obs observations made about bathing in Termae linked to a temple. What you bath in is not the sacred water in the antique sense, because mortals couldn't touch any sacred thing nor in temple, nor in a spring. Like sacrificial meat, the water belonging to a god or goddess is a gift of the divine owner of the spring, but in fact profane water when you receive this gift. At that point, it has lost its characteristics of sacred water. Secondly, the water is not primarily destined for healing purposes. That is what the modern Thermalism pretends, and what a lot of specialists deny. In Rome, the Termae were mainly a place of autium and well-being. And in Budapest, you know about it. Those who went there were mostly healthy and just wanted to relax. So a lot of Thermae in the countryside were built or used by the military. Obviously, sick people also went there because these places were popular, attracted charlatans and physicians, among other professionals, less recommendable, and also because bathing could relieve certain diseases of the bones, the skin, and so on. They didn't lot, doing a lot of drinking in the terms. That's only from the 16th century on, it seems, that uh, in the terms, uh, people in, with thermal springs, people started drinking. But let's not forget that every god, actually, could help sick people and that they mostly did so without water. That's the paradox. One only has to read the sacred tales of Ilius Aristides to see that uh, Asclepius, in his famous sanctuary in Pergamon, cured 
a fam famous hypochondriac, Aristides, with a lot of treatments, he tortured him really, but nearly barely ever with water. He even forbade him to bath for weeks. Third point, we shouldn't forget that in a town, as on the territory of a city, water was mostly used for cleansing. You had to wash before participating in a cult or before lying down for dinner. So a labrum, a nymphaeum, and if you had enough money, a bath, a balneum, were necessary for going on to conduct these social activities. Thank you very much.